Welcome to KURE Sports on ISU TV. I'm Taylor Mankel here welcoming you in to episode two of season two. That's right, we're back and we continue to go on. Even though I don't have any friends with me right now, we'll have a bunch coming in through this show. We've got a great show lined up for you. As you can see in our illustrious sidebar, we've got all kinds of sports that we're talking today, including some Iowa State football. I'll bring on Hunter Smith as well as Zach Williamson on to talk about some Iowa State football, break down the San Jose State game, as well as preview the Baylor game upcoming for this week in Iowa State football. We also have some MLB action for you as we've got Zach Williamson and Michael Morell. They'll both be jumping on with me to talk some MLB as the season comes to a close. We also get to talk a little bit about Cy Young's, a little bit about MVP, and of, co of course mention the Fernandez passing that we had in the past week. And then on top of that, we talk football. And not the football you're thinking of. We're talking about soccer to round off this episode of KUORI Sports on ISU TV. Andres and Laurel Feeks will join me. We'll talk some NWSL as well as some national, international soccer as well. So we've got a lot coming up this show, but first, before we get into things, I want to mention what KUORI Sports is, what we do. So through this strategic partnership that myself and ISU TV have formed together, we have the opportunity to basically cram one of our two-hour shows into a one-hour block and broadcast it live on TV. That's what we're doing right here. But this show in particular, looking to simulcast this show and put it out on both our airwaves and KURE's airwaves, should be a great partnership that has already, through the last year, really improved our promotions through both ISU TV and KURE Sports. Now a little more about KURE Sports. We are chock full of different shows that you can enjoy on KURE 88.5 FM. Like we start off on Tuesdays with the Sports View that's right before this program from 4 to 5. Then of course ISU, KURE Sports on ISU TV here from 5 to 6. On the Wednesday we have the Midweek Roundup from 4 to 6 and the Sound of the Storm from 7 to 9. On Thursday, we have the Clone Zone from 4 to 6. Friday, the weekend pregame. And Saturday, Cyclone Talk. And on top of all of that, we also have some live broadcasts that we do for all kinds of sports, including football, men's and women's basketball, some softball, and we're even trying to get some hockey and soccer on the docket this year. It's a great year to be a part of KURE Sports. If you'd like to join, if any of this sounds interesting, visit our website, KURE885.org, or give me an email, sports at KURE885.org. Now, of course, uh, like I said, this show, we've got a huge, a bunch of stuff coming up, including Iowa State football, MLB, and some soccer, or as we like to call it on KURE Sports Football. But first, before we get to any of that, we want to take a step back and look at a game that was, that was Iowa State against San Jose State. We had the broadcast live from Jack Trice Stadium. Myself and Patrick Stanek were on the call. We've got some highlights lined up for you right here on KURE Sports on ISU TV. Welcome to Jack Trice Stadium right here on KURE Sports. I'm Taylor Mankel along with Patrick Stanek here broadcasting live Iowa State football against San Jose State. Wow. They're going to reverse the call wow. and give Alan Lazard the touchdown with a fantastic effort to get the foot down. That is one of the best examples of dragging one foot I have seen this season. Any team. That's, he had no business having that touchdown. Not at all. He had Holy probably a five-inch gap to put his foot down, and by God, Alan Lazard did it. That's a touchdown for the Cyclones. Here to put them up, 6-0, to zero. extra point to come from Cole Net. Takes the handoff, dropping back to pass, pressure off his foot, thrown up, and it is intercepted by the Cyclones. Going the other way is Jamal Wilt, who heads out of bounds at the 35, and that evens the turnover battle. A bad throw, jumping throw by Love right into the hands of Jamal Wilts on the jumping interception for the Cyclones to take over. Yeah, the Cyclones had some great pressure right there. I don't know why San Jose State decided to throw it on that play. Uh, great pressure by the Cyclones. Love felt, felt it, threw it off, and that leads to the first interception of the season for Iowa State. Park in the hurry up. Stack to the right side, the handoff to Warren. Up the middle, in for six. Touchdown, Mike Warren. Yeah, he just two yards, found a hole, got in there, dove in. That was an easy touchdown for Mike Warren. Love in the shotgun. Takes the snap, drops back. 
Pressure is coming from Thomas. He gets a hand on it, and that one tips it up there. That'll be an intercepted by Iowa State and taken to the 25-yard line for the are tackled there. The pressure forcing another interception for the Cyclones, their second of the season. Yeah, second of the game and second of the season. Hopefully this will this will be some good confidence for Iowa State going forward. Even if they if they stay at two, Iowa State needs to get some turnovers. State season after season they're always down on the turnover battle. Park gets a snap, drops back, looking to pass, looking left side, looking deep. He's got his man Daly open touchdown Cyclones. That was a beautifully run route right there. Kind of a little comeback fake. Got the defensive back to bite on it. Perfectly timed. Park threw that ball before he even made his break to go back in the end zone on that. That was just a great timing route right there for the Cyclone. As Love looks to pass, it's intercepted by the Cyclone. Went to the right side of the field, and that one is picked off. Brian Peavy with the interception, the third interception of the season. All three coming today. Landing. Shotgun. Two receivers right, one left. Fake the handoff to Montgomery. Pressure's coming behind him. Throws deep. Going to the middle, got his man for a touchdown! Huge pass down the middle for the Cyclones. Jones on the catch. Down the middle, wide open, put a break on his man late. Deshante Jones. Love takes a snap, going back shoulder, wide open in the end zone. Touchdown San Jose State. Wide open was Tim Crawley for the touchdown for San Jose State. A lapse of judgment on the defensive end allows the wide open Toss from Love to Crosby for six. Josh Love under center. Still got Ziegler in there at running back. They'll fake the handoff to him and look to throw. Looking right side, looking deep. They've got a man. Oh. Intercepted after the tip from Nigel Tribune. Kamari Cotton Moya dives in and snags that one. Iowa State with the fourth interception of the day. Holy cow, that's, that's great team defense that right is. there. Batting the ball away. Cotton Boy is sticking with it, getting it out to Tim. That was that was a heck of a play. Screen left side. That'll be a touchdown for your Cyclones. Deshante oh, Jones again. Exactly. Another tight, another touchdown for Deshante Jones as the Cyclones extend their lead. There was some miscommunication on there. We're going with the hurry up after that big catch and hit um, on the previous play. They had two lined up on the left side, but a little staggered. Only one defensive back. Quick snap in the screen leads to an easy score for Deshante Jones and the cycle. Drops back, he's looking to pass, looking right, then left. Now he's moving. In motion, as a man, Trevor Ryan in for six. Touchdown, Iowa State. Trevor Ryan wide open on the left side, near the sideline, sneaks in, gets in front of the pylon for the touchdown. On third and six, Jacob Park delivers a strike while on the run for another Cyclone score. Great protection right there by the Iowa State offensive line. Park had a lot of time back there. Didn't know if you started to scramble out and found Ryan on the left side for a touchdown. With only 19 seconds remaining, they'll let that tick off the clock as Matt Campbell and company get their first win here in Ames, Iowa, and as an Iowa State coaching staff. Final score from Ames as the clock reads 0-0-0. 44 to 10 right here on KURE Sports. And welcome back to KURE Sports on ISU TV. What you just heard were some highlights from the broadcast on Saturday. That was myself, if you couldn't tell, and Patrick Stanick on the call from Jack Trice Stadium as Iowa State was victorious for the first time this season against San Jose State in Jack Trice Stadium. But do not worry, because we've got a lot of analysis and breakdown of that game and the upcoming game right after this on KURE Sports on ISU TV. We also have some MLB talk and some football talk all coming up on this program. It's going to be a great one. I guarantee it. But stay tuned to KURE Sports on ISU TV. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to KUR Sports on ISU TV. I'm Taylor Mankel. We've joined by Hunter Smith. Hunter, how's it going? Good. Happy to be back again. Well, I'm glad to have you back. Great part to this show now. So, what we're going to be talking about in this segment, we're going to be talking about some Iowa State football coming off their first win of the season against San Jose State at home at Jack Trice Stadium. Of course, you were there. You were live tweeting for us on KURE Sports. That's at KURE Sports. First off, how was the experience being at an Iowa State football game from the press box? Incredible. I've never been actually to a college football game in my life, so that was definitely um, a major step, especially to go to the press box. So. Free food, free pop, and, uh, you know, surrounded by the press. I mean, it was quite a different experience. I mean, not able to cheer quite as much as I'd want sure, to, but, sure. I mean, it was still an incredible day and definitely a lot to live tweet about on that game. Absolutely, there was. It was a very busy game, so let's start to get into that busy game and break down what happened against San Jose State and Iowa State. So let's start off on the offensive end, and I want to get your take because – Everybody's got an opinion on this. Iowa State, going into this game, they had used the two quarterback set against TCU, and they continued that against San Jose State. What are your thoughts on switching back and forth in between the two quarterbacks and Jacob Park and Joel Lanning? I've never agreed with it, and I still okay. really don't, mm -hmm. but we finally saw it work. And I, yeah, think, that's the thing. I think a lot of that had to do with San Jose State. I mean, they were bad. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no doubt about it, they were bad. But... At the same time, we saw it work with both Joel Lanning and Jacob Park. And i got to say, i got to give this week to Jacob Park. He mm -hmm. was the better quarterback. And granted, neither one of them threw interceptions, and both of them seemed to have a very good day. But um, the two-quarterback system, I don't think it's something that Iowa State wants to stick with, especially going into Big 12 play. I think they need to find someone that they can build a foundation around. And Campbell talked about it in his post-game interview about how they're able to feed off of each other and work together to help build a strong foundation for that team. But... I think you need to surround it around one person. You need to build that offense around one person, and I think they're a lot alike, but I think you've got to pick one and you've got to stick with them. Yeah, you know, I'm inclined to agree with you. It's like that old saying that we've heard a lot in the past couple weeks. If you have two starting quarterbacks, you have zero starting quarterbacks. So with that being said, I, I totally agree with you. It's the first time that we've seen that work. And I think it's the first time that you've seen a quarterback system like this work in a very long time, especially because the quarterbacks aren't too different. Jacob Park and Joel Lanning, they're both semi-mobile quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. Joel Lanning can lower his shoulder a little more. Jacob Park probably a little more elusive. They both have decent arms, not great arms. Uh, and they both have decent decision making. But I, I agree with you as well that Jacob Park, he played the better game. I don't know if he won the job by any means, because that C on the chest of Joel Lanning means a lot. Yeah. But I don't know if this coaching staff, Matt Campbell and company, are going to choose just one quarterback. It seems that they are quite happy with how things are going with the two quarterback system. I too don't know if it's the right way to go. I don't know if it's going to be the most successful way in going, uh, but I think it's going to be really interesting. So do you, you said Joel, you said Jacob Park had the better game, but do you think that if you were coaching Steph, you were Matt Campbell or the offensive coordinator, would you put Jacob Park starting quarterback against Baylor on Saturday? And that's why I don't make the big bucks. That's yeah. a call that is huge. Mm -hmm. Joel Lanning has been more consistent all around throughout the season. Granted, Iowa State has had some pretty bad games to start out sure. the season, but Joel Lanning has been the better quarterback. Jacob Park had one hell of a game mm -hmm. against San Jose State. There's yeah. no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, i got to pick Joel Lanning to start that. And I don't know how things are looking in practice. I don't know um, who's getting the better reps in practice and who they think looks better. Yeah. But i got to give it to Lanning. He's, mm -hmm. you know, the junior quarterback. He is the captain. Yeah. And that's a huge, huge for a team to build around him, a uh, junior and a captain, over the sophomore, Jacob Park. Yeah, it's difficult to say that you have Jacob Park start out there. But I don't see it as too, as too hard of a thing to believe considering that uh, – that team, they go two uh, sets of downs and then they switch. And then they go two more sets of downs and then they switch quarterbacks. So if it's that system, I don't see it as too blasphemous to put Jacob Park out there to start that game, let him go two series, then throw Joel Lanning in there. But if they're trying to start a quarterback for the entire game, I agree with you. I think Joel Lanning has to be that guy. You've got to put your captain out there. He's been consistent. He has big 12 uh, confidence. He's played big 12 games. He's won a big 12 game. So that puts him above... Uh, the head of Jacob Park. However, uh, I would like to see 
what Jacob Park would do with maybe even an entire half or an entire game. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? I think that he would have, I mean, just seeing what he put up in the second quarter and then the fourth quarter against San Jose State, he was good. And it's tough to say what he could do with an entire game, yeah. but it's great. I would love to see what he could do with mm -hmm. an entire game. But then again, you take away Lanning, and then it's tough to see where you're going to be at with them. I mean, it would be different, I think, if Joel Lanning was a senior and he was a sophomore. Because then you could True. say, okay, do we finish with what we've built up here, or do we start the system over again? And if that was the case, I would have to take Park in that mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is tough to say, look, you're sitting as a senior, and we're going to put it in the sophomore over you. But, I mean, if you could build him up from that sophomore point, which is what they're starting to do now, and I think they're going to be successful with it, to get him up to that level when he's a senior, mm -hmm. I think it will be huge for the Cyclones. And they're looking to build up the program, and I think they could do it with Jacob Park. The problem is right now it's tough to work the two-quarterback system. It is. But so far, I mean, against San Jose State, and we're going to have to see, Baylor's going to be a big testament oh, yeah. to what this two-quarterback system is truly going to look like this season. I think that's going to be the deciding factor on who is going to play. Mm -hmm. I think Baylor's going to be that um, deciding factor. So end of the day, uh, give me what you think the coaching staff will do. Do you think they're going to try for a starter against Baylor, or do you think they're going to continue with the flopping back and forth between Landing and Park? I think you're going to look for the two-quarterback system to yeah. reign supreme again against Baylor. I don't think there's any doubt about it. On his uh, post-game conference, he had no intentions of starting someone. And he, sure. said, and he said, you know, something might change in practice. But especially after San Jose State, with both of them playing so well, mm -hmm. especially Jacob Park, I don't think there's any doubt we're going to see the two-quarterback system come into play again this week. I I, totally, yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And that can help when you're playing a team like San Jose State and you see how dominant that team was against the Spartans. So I think exactly what you said, having Baylor come in this weekend is going to just tell the tale of how uh, good potentially Jacob Park and Joel Lennon can play in a game. It did not fare well in TCU. Granted, that was one of the first times they tried that flip-flopping back and forth. So let's see what happens on Saturday against Baylor. But first, let's talk a little bit about the defense of Iowa State on Saturday against San Jose State. It was a very good defensive effort out of the Cyclones. Granted, again, San Jose State, as we will say time and time again. But what stuck out to you the most of this defense, defensive performance? i got to say the turnover battle. Absolutely. I mean, they dominated the turnover battle. They had more mm -hmm. interceptions than San Jose had punts. Mm -hmm. So it was overall, it was a good, solid defensive effort to stop the Spartans dead in their tracks. I mean, what, they didn't score till, well, I guess they didn't score a touchdown until, like, yeah, second half. Mm -hmm, so, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, they pretty well um, shut down the Spartans. And like we said at the start, San Jose was not a good team. No. And even I wasn't expecting that kind of a thorough beatdown that the Cyclones put out. And, I mean, and that was one of the biggest things. They looked like they played together. They, they finally did. looked like they were out there enjoying what they were doing, mm -hmm. playing the game. And I think that was bigger than any score that could have been put up. They were all finally playing together and they were enjoying what they were doing. It wasn't, you know, getting creamed by Iowa. It wasn't going and getting beaten by TCU. It was finally coming together and working together. And I'm hoping that's something more than anything, you know, as far as the score tells against Baylor, I think that's something that people are going to be looking for. Yeah, you saw that cohesion. I like that you brought that up. You saw it, I think you saw sparks of it in the TCU game. Granted, they weren't playing very well in this game, but they really did show that they were trying mm -hmm. for the full four quarters. I think that was a huge part to at least not getting obliterated as bad as it could have been in Fort Worth. But uh, you saw that just little bits of it against TCU, but I think you really saw that full mm -hmm. force against San Jose State. Granted, it's at home. That always helps. You got a brand new uni that you're bringing out, which I want to get your take on that right now as well. The Storms Bruin uh, unis they had out there, the gray with the cardinal and gold trim. What are your thoughts on this? I personally like them. Yeah. I really do. And okay. I've heard that from a lot of people mm -hmm. about liking these uniforms. And they're saying, expect them to come back. And I mean, how could you not? I mean, sure. they look good. You know, you see them dressed in red. You know, you see them in the gold unis. And I'm not a huge fan of the gold ones. But I think these gray ones, I really enjoy them. And I think that there's definitely something that we're going to see coming back again this season. Normally, I would say I like them. And I like change for Iowa State football. That's one thing. But when you are broadcasting the game, it is so hard to see those numbers on those jerseys. That was not okay. But regardless, I think it was a good idea for them to bring out that, even though I think it would have been way cooler if they would have brought it out in a night game. That, that, so that would have been, been way that cooler. Been that been been way cooler. I, okay. It was 11 a.m. It was too early for cool. <laughs> but regardless, uh, let's get back to the defense. 
I really like what you mentioned about the turnovers. That was huge. They didn't have any interceptions coming into this game. They had four interceptions leaving this game against San Jose. That San Jose State. That's huge, especially going into now all of you all you have is Big 12 play. You've got a lot of high octane offenses that you have to play against, including Baylor that's coming to Jack Trice this Saturday broadcast live on KURE Sports. So I think that is a huge part to this confidence because it is against a San Jose State. It's not against a very good team and a backup quarterback in San Jose State, yeah. Josh Love. So that's another factor that you have to put in there. But the confidence that that brings for this team is going to be huge. And I think that was a secondary-led defensive effort out of the Cyclones, especially Kamari Cotton Moyle with 11 tackles, nine of them solo. And then he adds in an interception as well. Huge game out of him really showing what he does with that with that captain sticker on his chest. Now, let's talk about potential leaving this game. What do you think Iowa State's potential is after grabbing their first win of the season? I feel a lot more confident about them, at least against Kansas. I mean, okay. yeah, I think I we can get the Kansas game taken care of, but I mean, you look at some of these other teams that are a little bit lower in the Big 12, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that we could get the win against them, but I think we have a better shot now than we ever did before. Mm -hmm. And it might just be the San Jose was that bad and that sure. we got rolling and that we really kept the ball rolling and they we did. were able just to they annihilate did. them. But I look to see them, you know, take down some of the Texas Techs, to take down, um, maybe even take a shot at Kansas State. I think that this is a team that might be able to keep the ball rolling and keep the momentum going into the Big 12 season. But as far as um, Baylor goes, I mean, it's going to be a tough game. It's yeah. going to be a dogfight. It is going to be a very tough game against a very good team coming off a very good win against Oklahoma State. A mm -hmm. lot of factors going uh, against Iowa State in this game, talent being near the top of yeah. them. Baylor has a lot of talent, even with all the suspensions and all the head coach turnover, all that kind of stuff. That's a team with a lot of talent out there. That being said, this Iowa State team has never shown uh, what they can do with momentum on their side. So that's an interesting factor that they have behind them, that the coaching staff has behind them in Ames, Iowa. So that's important. But let's break down this uh, Baylor game. Give me a key to the game, uh, first off, for the Cyclones to win this one. Without a doubt, they got to start out fast. I mean, mm -hmm. they got to come out of the gate. There's going to be no time for them to sit back and, well, we'll come back into it. Exactly. No. Baylor will stomp them into the ground if they do not come out and get them first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether Iowa State starts on defense or offense, they have to set the tone either with a three and out on defense, which is going to be tough, or they got to move the ball, either with Mike Warren, Deshante Jones, or um, you know any other one of the factors on offense. However they do it, they need to move the ball or they need to get a quick three and out and mm -hmm. really set the tone quick. Absolutely. That's a very good point there, Hunter. I agree with you. A strong start is important against a team like Baylor because Baylor, any chance you get, any chance they get, they'll put their foot on your throat oh, yeah. and they will end the game as soon as possible. High octane offense, not as dominant as they have been in the past couple years, but still very dominant nonetheless, even with injury suspensions and whatnot. I look for a key to the game to be Opening up uh, both sides of the offense. You have to have a mix and match of running and passing in order to open up the defense of Baylor's. Baylor's defense is decent. It's not good. It's probably the weak point on their team with, of the three aspects of the game, offense, defense, special teams. So I think you really have to shock that system in Baylor's defense. And it doesn't sound very realistic, but nearly every, if not every time you have the ball, you got to score. Yeah. You got to I mean, score. No, yeah. You can't have empty possessions against a Baylor team. Even if you have them at home, that might give you an extra possession where you can get back with the crowd in the game. But this is, and then again, it's also an 11 a.m. game, another one on FS1. <laughs> so it's not going to be the greatest crowd for Baylor, but that might give you a little bit of leeway. But it's Baylor. You got to score almost every single time if you want to just stay in this game and have a chance to knock off the Bears in the Big 12 play. So let's look at players to watch this game. Who do you have as a player to watch for Iowa State? I saw Deshante Jones. He really came out and he, he had did. a strong game against the Spartans. And I mean, we've seen some trouble here with um, Lazard starting now the mm. season. And you know, that was against Iowa, that was the major point, is shut down Lazard. We saw Jones come out against San Jose State and have a very, very um, promising game. Mm -hmm. And then Mike Warren, he has been running better. TCU was really the start, and then San Jose State, he turned up the throttle even more. I look for those two to be key po um, points in this game, okay. especially when you consider that Park and Lanning are going to be switching back and forth more than likely. It's going to be tough to really um, look at for one of them to be the key deciding factor. So I look for either uh, Warren 
or um, Jones to okay. be that deciding factor okay. in the game. Yeah, those are good ones on the offensive end. I like those ones a lot. Deshante Jones obviously coming off a very good game against San Jose State. Couple touchdowns in that game and a bunch of yards to go on th on top of that. Granted, that might be due a little bit to the fact of the secondary of San Jose mm -hmm. State. Yeah. He is one of the smaller receivers on the team, only standing at 5'10", so we'll see how he fares against Baylor. I like those though. Mike Warren, I think the offensive line is finally getting confident enough mm -hmm. to think that they can run block. And once that's happening, they're starting to open up some holes. The running game has been much better in the last two games for Mike Warren and company, even though he had that one fumble early on in that game against San Jose State. But also, my player to watch this game, I'm going to give it to kind of two players. I'm going to give it to Regan Northrup as well as Kane Seeley. The linebackers have to be a lot better for Iowa State. Yeah. Even though San Jose State only scored 10 points, they ran all over that Cyclone defense with two backs, not just one extraordinary, extraordinary back. Cooper and Ziegler ran all over the Cyclones. Ziegler had 100 plus yards. Cooper had 64, if I'm not mistaken. So that's, that's a very bad defensive performance from the front seven. You need to see the linebackers step it up on the defensive side for Iowa State if they want a chance to win this game. But make sure if you do want to catch this game, you can catch it right here on KURE Sports. That will be at 11 a.m. Our pregame will start at 10.30 from Jack Trice Stadium. It will be myself and Patrick Stanek on the call. We're going to take a quick break and be back with MLB right after this. Welcome back to Kiori Sports on ISU TV. I'm Taylor Mankel. Two new people join me. We've got Michael Morell and Zach Williamson here on the program to talk some MLB. We're going to finally talk some baseball yes. on Kiori Sports on ISU TV. It's getting that time of the year where things are getting real, real interesting. But before we get into that, we're going to start on a somber note. We're going to talk about Fernandez, obviously, losing a player from Miami early this week in a boating accident. Talk about kind of the response from baseball in this very tragic time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this has to be one of the more shocking losses in, yeah. in sports. Very and young, very young. Seen, and, and not just young, just a pure dominant. Like, th this, this was a pitcher who a lot of people thought might be the best pitcher over the next decade. Mm -hmm. I mean, this wasn't just a young player, a young prospect that, that lost his life. This was a player that was already dominant, was, out, was consistently in Cy Young contention. He was he had the highest strikeout percentage of any pitcher ever, at like I believe it was thirty one percent. I mean, that's Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens. This was a player with so much potential, and for him to lose his life so early, and not even considering the fact what he meant to that community down yeah. in Miami as oh, yeah. a Cuban-born player, 
you, know, you hear the stories of on his the trip that he got back his mom mm -hmm. fell out and he dove into the water yeah. to save his mom I mean, from drowning like there, th this was just by all accounts such an important player to that Miami team I mean this is a team that has the most expensive player in baseball and mm -hmm. Giancarlo Stanton and he was still the face of that franchise. He was, he was, that's crazy. Talk a little bit about what this has meant and what the MLB has done to respond. Uh, I mean like you said, I mean, it's an incredible story that just that he even got to America mm -hmm. and in the majors, yeah. and like you said, how dominant he was. Uh, it really is tragic, and mm -hmm. uh, it's really sad. I mean, it's, it just sucks overall. Mm -hmm. uh, 24 years old, it's it's terrible. But overall, the Marlins have really come together they so have. far, and so have uh, really the rest of Major League Baseball as well. Yeah, and let's talk about what happened uh, when the Marlins took the field last night. In particular, talk about what happened with D. Gordon. Mm -hmm. I mean, D. Gordon was probably, based on reactions in press conferences, mm -hmm. was one of the players that was taking the hardest, the yeah. loss of Jose Fernandez. And you really couldn't write a, a story any better. First no. at bat, first pitch, he, li he gets in the right side of the batter's box, it was opposed to his normal left, wearing Jose Fernandez's helmet, as they're all wearing Jose Fernandez's jersey. Mm -hmm. And then two pitches later, he gets in the left side of the batter's box, and he hits a home run, first home run of the season for mm -hmm. D. Gordon. Not even a home run player, first home run, first home run of the season. I mean, you, I, you couldn't think of a more storybook way to start no, that game. No, it's absolutely touching, and to see him round the bases, tears running down his face, absolutely incredible way. A good tribute, a good mm -hmm. uh, tip of the cap to the Marlins, and of course, D. Gordon to Fernandez. So let's jump into some uh, more MLB talk, more on a playing perspective. Now let's start off with something that's on everybody's mind, the playoff picture as of right now. Uh, break it down, what does it kind of look for right now in the MLB? Well, I, I think it's just good to start with the National League cause, yeah. because the Cubs are in the National League. They're the best team in baseball, no one's going to debate it. 100 wins already with still six or seven games to play. That's wild. Uh, I mean, it's just they, they've yeah. had a great season. It is. It's out um, of control. But, I mean, so the Cubs are going to have the number one seed in the NL. That's, that's not a question. Yep. And then you, but you look, the number two and number three, they're very close. I believe mm -hmm. the Dodgers, yeah, the Dodgers, I believe, are a game back in the Nationals. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's right there, neck and neck. And that's important because it's determining who gets home field in yeah. that uh, five game series mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> between, between those two teams. And then there's, of course, the NL wild card race, which is just crazy. It's out of control. And we'll touch on the wild cards, but uh, Zach, tell us a little bit about the AL. Uh, the American League, the Indians uh, just clinched the other day for the American League Central. Uh, the Rangers clinched for the West, and the Red Sox have also clinched, not quite the division yet, but have clinched a spot. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it really looks like it's a fair game for whoever's going to get home field advantage in the American League. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it looks like the Red Sox have a lead right now. Uh, that could change easily, but mm -hmm. we'll see. I mean, it's going to be a fun race to watch. Yeah, it will be a fun race, and potentially the most fun of that is the wild card. And let's look at that now, starting off with the NL. Yeah, the NL wild card is definitely just, it's a toss-up, really. I mean, the, the Mets probably have a slight advantage based on their schedule, and, you know, they, do have, they are a game and a half up on the Cardinals and a game up on the Giants right now. But I mean, they're all separated within, I believe, one loss or two, one loss each. You know, which is so. Like I believe the Cardinals and Giants are a loss behind the Mets. But other than that, it's just neck and neck across the board, and it's something that's been neck and neck for like mm -hmm. a week and a half now. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, crazy. I mean, it's just they've all been right there, game for game, with each other. If and it's just. It's crazy. I mean, it's very conceivable that these teams could end up in a three-way tie. That's crazy. That's crazy. But very possible. Zach, I want to hear uh, your two. From, from both AL and L, NL in the wild card? Uh, kind of like you touched on, uh, looking at schedules was kind of big for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cardinals are one game out from the second spot. They have three games at home versus the Reds. They also got three games against the Pirates, who mentally might not be with it anymore now that they're kind of out of the race. Yeah. Uh, the Giants have three at home with the Rockies, three at home with the Dodgers. You have to question if Dodgers are going to start there. You know, best pitchers, or maybe if they're going to sure. rest them up for the playoffs. You have to consider it is Ben Scully's last game too. Yeah, on, that's true. On Sunday, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I had to pick, I think I would go with the Giants and Cardinals. Uh, the Mets have two more games in Miami. I, I like what Miami's doing right now. I mean, they have a lot to play for. They do. Mm -hmm. So I think the Giants and Cards are going to get in there. Uh, in American League. Uh, Toronto and uh, Baltimore have a big three-game series right now, which mm -hmm. uh, will really tell us a lot about what's going to happen in the wild card. 
Uh, I think both of those two teams are going to hang on. The Mariners might make so? a push. The Orioles have been dropping they have real been. fast recently. They have been. But it just seems like nobody else is really stepping up for the, yep. to take it from them. The Tigers just recently lost, lost a series of the Royals. Mm. They're already down in the series to the Indians. So uh, I think the Tigers are the most talented team there. Okay. But I don't know if they're going to get it together in time. Give me your two from both, Michael. Um, the NL, I'm going to have a little different. I think the Giants are going to miss the playoffs this year. I think, it's, okay. it's going to be the Cardinals and the, and the Mets. Um, I, I think the Cardinals could out that because with the news about the Mets pitching, they also lost Noah Syndergaard, you know, mm. uh, or not Noah Syndergaard, um, Stephen Matz today. Um, so they're, they're just having so many injuries. I think their schedule is going to get them in to okay. the playoffs, but I just I don't think they're going to have what it takes to get get move on in the playoffs just from a mental aspect of, okay. I mean losing okay. so many pitchers sure um, and then the AO it's just it's so close there's it is. there's really four potentially five teams if you want to if Houston could make a run in these final six or seven games I mean I, I'm, I'm gonna go with probably Toronto and Detroit just because Detroit's okay. so talented Detroit and Baltimore just hasn't looked good at the yeah. worst possible time mm -hmm. so I'm inclined to believe you on the on the AL side, Michael. I think that Detroit will take over the Orioles spot, but I think I think for sure Toronto is going to make that one spot in the wild card. And then as for the NL, I think the Cards get in, and it is an every other year and even yep. year. I mean, yep. you, you gotta you gotta think maybe Giants there. So I'll agree with Zach on the NL. Agree with you on the AL. All right, moving on. Let's talk about the World Series. As is on everybody's mind for the entire MLB season who will win the World Series and what two teams will make the World Series. I ask you guys these questions right now. We're more informed than we were last year when we asked these questions at this desk at a different time. Uh, but regardless, Michael, give me your two World Series teams. Who's going to win that World Series and in how many games? Okay. So on the AL side, I think it's the Rangers. I truly yeah. believe the Rangers are the best team in the American okay. League. They're okay. most talented, but with Hugh Darvish and Cole Hamels at the top of that rotation. Hard I, to beat. I, I think the Rangers come out of the AL. The NL, believe it or not, it's a little tougher. Because it's I, interesting. I don't know. The Cubs pitching, I, haven't, I don't know quite what to make of it yet, especially with Hendricks not being a strikeout pitcher. I, I don't know what to make of that with with MLB, I mean, there's just something about the playoffs that causes hitters to hit better, and I, and mm -hmm. I don't know why. No, it just accurate. does. That's accurate, yeah. And not being able to strike people out, I'm not sure how, I could be wrong, but it makes me a little nervous having, having pitchers at the top of that rotation that now, don't Michael, strike people out. don't you dare say the Cardinals are making <laughs> no. the World Series. As much he as wants to I so want bad. to so badly, <laughs> but I, I just can't. I, no. I've seen time and time again where home run hitting teams just don't make runs, yeah. and they just, they just can't. Mm -hmm. And with the injuries between the Dodgers and and the Nationals these past couple of weeks, it's just I, I I just can't pull any of those. So I have to go with the Cubs just because I don't think any of those kind of by default, yeah, yeah, quite have that playoff makeup, sure. especially with injuries. Had the Nationals not lost Strasburg, I probably would have yeah. leaned towards the Nationals. Okay, but. okay. And Who then wins? of those, I think the Rangers win in six. Win in six. All right, Zach, give me your scenario. Uh, like you said, I think the Cubs are the most talented uh, team in the playoffs. Uh, but that matchup with the wild card game really scares me, whether it's the Giants, whether it's the Cardinals, even if it's the Mets. I mean, yeah. all three of those teams have some playoff experience, mm -hmm. especially, especially after just last year. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nationals and Dodgers just, they just can't quite break through. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd be interested to see them break through this year. Uh, I, don't, I think it's going to be hard without Wilson Ramos for the Nationals. Okay, yeah. Towards ACL, so... Uh, I'm going to go with the winner of the Cubs wild card game, but I think the Cubs are going to okay. do it. Okay. Right. And uh, in the American League, uh, pitching's big in October. I really like the Indian staff. Uh, wow. I think they can mm. score some runs. I think they're going to be really competitive in the playoffs. Like you said, the Rangers are extremely tough. Great one two punch at the top of the rotation. Really hit the ball. Uh, really can't count the Red Sox and Big Poppy either in yeah. his final year and uh, the lineup they have. But I think I'm going to go with the Indians. I think I'm going to take the Indians in six over the Cubs. In six? Oh, wow. 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 I have not heard that one yet. I'll tell you what. Uh, for my World Series, I won't tell you who's going to win because I don't want to do that. But I think the Cubs will make uh, the World Series. 
and Chicago may not survive after that. But <laughs> I also, I'm going to go with the Red Sox here. They've been on fire as of late, both offensively and defensively. I really like what I'm seeing out of the Red Sox right now. I think they'll continue that role onto the playoffs. And I don't know if America will be able to take a Boston-Chicago World Series, but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Awesome. We'll see what happens. And quickly now, let's talk about, let's just talk about MVPs here uh, to end our segment here on MLB. Zach, let's start with you. Who do you got for the MVPs? Uh, for the National League MVP, I like Chris Bryant. Okay. Uh, batted 295 this year, 39 homers, 101 RBIs so far. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's the leader in Chicago. He's the man in Chicago, and he's had a great year. Yeah, he has. Uh, Altuve is who I'd give it to in the American League. 338 average, 24 homers, mm -hmm. 95 RBIs, a lot for a little guy like him, and 28 stolen bases helps out as well. Yeah, that's huge. How about you, Michael? Who you got? Um, the National League, I think I've talked to this a little bit last week, but I think Daniel Murphy is just a guy because... Think I think he gets it over Bryant? I think he does because Riz is going to steal some votes from Bryant. That's true. That's who, the one thing who, that you When you have yeah. two guys on the same team, mm -hmm. they steal votes because people debate on who exactly. was more important to the team. Exactly. Um, in the AL side, the AL's tricky because the guy, the guy who's probably most qualified is Jose Altuve, mm -hmm. for, but it's so hard to give it to a team that didn't make the playoffs. But We've the seen is, that time and time again. But yeah. there's no one on play, on any of the player rosters that you really just look at and it's like, that's an MVP mm -hmm. candidate, which is mm -hmm. it's really strange what happened in the AL this year. But I'm, yeah, I'm and still, you can't give it to Trout because that team's awful. Yeah, yeah. You, Even though you statistically can't. he's the most efficient baseball player right Pretty now, sure. but I mean, you, you can't give it you to You can him. make the argument if Trout was on a playoff team, like if Trout was on the Red Sox, he could have four or five MVPs already. Oh, you can yeah. make that argument. Easily. And you, But I, I just have to give it to Altuve. I mean, he's mm -hmm. had such a good year. He really broke out. Uh, people questioned if he was going to be a pow have enough power, and he yeah. really proved that wrong this year. So I think Altuve gets the MVP this year. Yeah, I agree with you guys on Altuve, and I agree with Zach with Chris Bryant. I think the bomb helps a lot, you know, obviously just surpassing 100 RBIs last night as well. I think that helps. Big bats help, and especially when you're on the most dominant team in baseball. I do like what you're bringing up, though, Michael, how Rizzo will take a couple votes away from him. I don't think that'll be enough for Daniel Murphy to take the MVP race, however. That's all we have time for here on MLB Talk on KUR Sports on ISU TV. Stay tuned. We've got football right after this. Welcome back to KUA Sports on ISU TV. I'm Taylor Mankel. Two new people here to talk some football. Andre Safar and Laurel Feeks here from ISU TV and KUA. It's, it's a true partnership. But <laughs> we're talking football, but it may not be the football that you're thinking of. This is soccer football. Yeah, unless you're cultured, you'll you know. you got to be cultured yeah. here on football. KURA Sports. But everyone says football like it's only played in Spain or something. <laughs> it is football, and yeah. it makes more sense than American football. Yes, so it we're does. we're going to call it that. All right, we're going to start off with the NWSL, the playoffs. 
Yes, very exciting. We have Chicago, Washington, Portland, and Western New York. Mm. Um, kind of a mix that we're used to seeing, um, but then there's a couple of new teams in here that were previously uh, in the debut season. Mm -hmm. uh, so, That's right. Yeah, you mentioned that so, on earlier. Yeah, so Western New York and Portland, mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a rematch in the semifinals. They, were, um, they played against each other. In the finals, Portland came out on top in the debut season of the NWSL, so it's interesting to see kind of where. And then Western New York kind of fell off mm. the map, so to speak, and now they're back in the semifinals. Um, but what's really exciting to me is Chicago, my team. You're going to be a homer? I, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Chicago, my team, they're playing uh, Washington. They just beat them. At least you have a team. Let me just say that. Yeah, Go you ahead. know, there's that. Um, have a team. Yeah, so they beat them 3-1 uh, at Toyota Park in yep. Chicago. Um, both teams played very well when I was watching, mm -hmm. uh, created a lot of space, very fast teams. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there's always kind of been a rivalry with Chicago and Washington. It's, there you go. it's fun to watch them. Um, so very exciting to see. We have a couple of clips for um, Kristen Press, Carl Walls, and Sophia, Sophia Huerta, excuse me. That's right. Um, so if we could run that Kristen Press clip, she had an, an impressive goal. Uh, Cutting it back. Mm -hmm. and That's right. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Here, Here it go. is. So if you watch, yep, I'm going to slow mo. Cuts it back, knocks it right in. It almost looks like a chip. I in, know. In, in, in she, a sense. And, and she, it's you like know, golf. <laughs> yeah. She's had a rough time. You know, people have been doubting the way she finishes. Oh, no, that so, one's. This, yep. Here's Sofia Huerta. Mm -hmm. That one's definitely a chip. Oh gosh, beautiful. All right, Carl Walls, Sofia Huerta with the assist. This is a rookie, first goal of the Love season. Love it. Is that, that a nutmeg good. in there? Did I see a nutmeg I, in there? You did see a nutmeg in there. <laughs> Ouch. Watch this again. Boop, in between the legs. Oh, excuse me. I think. And just gets it right in, mm -hmm. sneaks it right in by the post. Carl Walls has impressed me. I watched her um, I, over the uh, summer. I was an intern for the Red Stars, so I got to mm -hmm. watch Carl kind of grow. And oh, were cool. you really? I was. <laughs> yeah. I was an intern for the Red Stars. At least. <laughs> okay, a couple of years. Yeah, so, no, I'm just kidding. That's awesome. Yeah, so, it's cool to see Kara start from one place and now end up mm. in the last game of the regular season and be able to score. Sure. Scoring goal, a goal like that. Exactly. You no know, less, yeah. And, you know, it's it was big, big deal. Three to one. We won our last, our they last game. We ended up. They, yeah, they did. They did. We, Didn't they? I'm not a part of the Red Stars. <laughs> Do you play? I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I might play Are you a part of the squad? Yeah, we got it. Exactly. We got a celebrity Sorry, status. Excuse me. They scored ah, three. I love it. Um, and of course, Crystal Dunn scored mm -hmm. the other point uh, for Washington. Uh, moving on to Portland and Western New York. Mm. So it's exciting to see this kind of split off. Um, we have Tobin Heath, Ali Long, Lindsey Horan, Megan Klingenberg, Emily Sonnet for Portland. Mm. They are clearly stacked. And then they, uh, have, yeah. <laughs> then they have an international roster that's like insane. They have mm. uh, wow. Christine Sinclair, Mana Shim. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's insane. Uh, Western New York, they kind of only have Sammy Mewis. Um, but they also, you know, they have a bunch of other players that are, have been really impressive, and it's cool to see them kind of make their way back into the Yeah, and if they still have the chemistry without the big names, that plays a huge role. And it's cool that to see that. Awesome. It, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. everybody thought, you know, Orlando would dominate. They had Alex yeah, Morgan. Exactly. Um, and, you know, they have a very stacked roster as well, but it's the, you know, the chemistry yeah. is, that's what comes right. down to it. Uh, Portland are the Shield winners this year. They were first place. And um, they will host Western New York at Providence Park. It's a tough place to play. Mm -hmm. Portland, yeah. huge soccer city. That's um, right. I've been impressed with Portland. They kind of trailed off like Western New York, too. They were always kind of middle of the pack, mm -hmm. but they really sure. come through. And, of course, you know, winning the Shield, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. different Absolutely. seasons, you know. You never know. Right. And so, you know, coming um, back last time they played Western New York, they beat them 3-2, to two, So, and that was in Portland. So hopefully I'm thinking they'll get the same results. Yeah. I'm so my playoff prediction. Yeah, let's though, hear it. I want to hear it. All right. Let's hot take it. from freaking Feeks. Let's hear hot it. Take. Hot take. Well, 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 Chicago right. and Washington have both <laughs> lost on the road four times. Chicago okay. is going to go to Washington. Of course, Washington's probably going to look out for you know, out for blood a little bit. Yeah. Uh, You're right. We just they just got beat by us. So it it'll be a tough game, but I say that Chicago will take this one, and Portland will definitely. Beat Western New York. Definitely. Like most definitely. definitely. I'm calling it right now. Portland's going to beat Western New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough. So, now I'm going to so watch it. So the NWSL final, it's going to be Chicago and Portland. First mm -hmm. time Chicago makes the final. Mm. And that'll be a good game. I can't quite decide who I think yeah, will win. It's, it's who you I want think, and who you think course, will win. Yeah, yeah you know, you know I, I always have that. That Chicago is not a team to like 
knock on. They're definitely they're very very good. Sure. Portland's also very very. That's good. why so they I made think, it. Really, yeah. I think it's kind of almost even. They're very they're very good teams, mm -hmm. and I think that um, the final will be Chicago and Portland. Okay. Okay. Um, Squeeze it. You heard it some, here. Onto some kind of sad news. Lauren yeah. Holiday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's right. A uh, midfielder who retired this year. She. Um, has to have surgery. She has a brain tumor, That's right. um, unfortunately, That's and it's uh, about six weeks out. Um, they kind of moved it up. They induced her early. She was pregnant at the same time. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they induced her early. She just had a baby girl, um, I think about a week. I believe she's married to an go. NBA star yeah, as well. Yeah, so she's yeah. married to Drew Holiday, a uh, guard mm. for New Orleans Pelicans, mm -hmm. and um, he's on indefinite leave. They don't really know when sure. he's going to come sure. back. Sure. He, uh, his first priority is Lauren and the baby. And so more news on that to kind of come. Yeah. But congratulations to them on the baby girl. Yeah, it's good. Hopefully She's it's healthy. successful. Yeah. She's yeah. healthy and I think they're they're happy right now yeah. for the circumstances. And thoughts to sure. them for the future, Likewise. for sure. Yep. For sure. Now, Andreas, let's, let's talk some Champions League. Well, there's a lot of big news today going on. The Champions League is one of the big, yeah, big ones. Yeah, let's start um, with there. Borussia Dortmund, they hosted Real Madrid. This is the big one of the yep. day. Mm -hmm. um, it ended up 2-2. Real Madrid, of course, holding champions, and, and Borussia Dortmund have just been on fire with goals coming from all sorts of places. Um, Leicester City, of course, the, the, un, the surprising champions of the Premier League uh, last campaign are mm -hmm. you know, now in the Champions League and are doing well. They won their second game. 1-0 against Porto, so they have four goals and zero conceded in two games. Like I was saying uh, on the Clone Zone on Thursdays, that I think they'll go through the group mm -hmm. um, with relative ease as opposed, you know, compared to to the other groups. Um, as far as leaving the round of 16, it's a little shit. It depends on who they draw against because they get first place. Yeah. You know, they might get a, a second place team in a different group. So, mm -hmm. but um, still very interesting to watch. Tottenham Hotspur of England, they needed a win. They got a win um, at Ceska Moscow. In, um, in Russia, of course, 1-0. And then Dinamo Zagreb hosted Juventus. Juventus are the my picks for the uh, Champions really? League winner. They are. They are. They really? have a complete team. They have huh. a complete team. Complete um, team. They won 4-0 today. I think I could regret it, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> I, I think Juventus could go, okay, they'll at least go to the final, I believe. Yeah. Really? Once they bought Iguain and they have a couple defenders in there, yeah. Yes, I, I firmly believe that they will be c uh, contenders. If they don't make it into the top four even, I'm going to be upset with mine. So. But I think, <laughs> I'm like, wow, I'm off my game. You know, First it's Premier League Fantasy, now it's anything I talk about. So uh, tomorrow we have big games. We have Atletico and hosting Bayern. That's a you know, contrast in styles. Yeah. Um, two heavyweights, obviously. We have Celtic hosting Man City. Laurel Feeks' Man City for you like some Man reason. City? Yeah, 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 for you. Mm. Well, Money can buy you love. You're no? playing Celtic tomorrow. You got a pretty good. Pretty good, good luck. Game. I'm uh, <laughs> upset. I'm doubtful. I mean, Man City They're are red drop hot. They're going to drop 10 on them. They're going to drop 10 on them. <laughs> then you would, 10. Don't put it past them. 10, 10 11, shot. and put a. Uh, yeah, that'll that'll yeah. set a record right there. Yeah. Uh, you got Napoli hosting Benfica. That's a good one to watch. And you got Borussia Mönchengladbach. They will host Barcelona. Now, I said there's a lot of big news today. Yeah. Um, that's not the biggest news. Uh, mm -mm. The big news comes out of the England camp. Um, head coach Sam Allardyce, he, well, he had just been appointed in July to the, you know, the head coaching position, and he's only uh, managed one game until allegations came out today about him. Um, he was an ambassador for, for, I believe, the English Premier League or something like that, and then... Um, the journalists uh, were undercover as um, businessmen from firms looking to, you know, get involved with the Premier yeah. League and stuff like that. Uh, it was in, in Hong Kong and Singapore. And what happened was, and I was reading up about the article, the businessmen were um, looking to get around certain transfer regulations um, by the FA because there's this third-party ownership that's a problem. It's, it's a big issue that's come about. And not only has the FA, the Football Association of England, um, outlawed it, and now FIFA has outlawed it in recent years. Um, it, it's essentially, what it is, it's, it's almost like a football slavery, it's been, it's been termed. Mm -hmm. This business or company will have all rights to, your, to a player's economic rights, so they can take them and put them wherever they want, they can take however percentage of wages from them, stuff like that, so they outlawed that, for good reason, yeah. for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, now what, so. what happened <laughs> was, yeah, it comes, you know, manipulations of like right. that, um, and, and uh, 
the quote reportedly from Sam Allardyce is um, to these businessmen, businessmen, uh, talk about investigative journalism, mm -hmm. um, you, he, he said you could still get around it. Obviously, there's a lot of money here, referring to England, of and stuff like that. And whether or not he's advocating it kind of sounds like either way. Um, for someone to be an ambassador and now the England coach, or was, I should say, um, you shouldn't be saying that. And so subsequently, he's been fired or left today, depending on where you read it. Um, and I'm wondering, what, with what we have, do you guys think somebody like that should be fired from, from his post? Because I think in that sort of a, and I'll issue this first, with this whole FIFA bribery and corruption scandal, I think the FA has put down a marker and said, oh, we're yeah. not going to stand for that. Especially in these times, you got to go. There's no way. Yeah, and I think that is why he was fired. Mm. I don't necessarily think that means he should be fired because his quote and what he has been saying around this don't necessarily mean that he's for this. Mm -hmm. They It can be taken a different way uh, that he knows that this could happen, which it very well could. And, and the I'm thing is, it still, it still happens in Brazil and Argentina. It does. It just ha and that's why I'm wondering, is advocation or is he just saying... Look, it happens. Uh, but he's been noted to come out against the, the FA and stuff and say things about sure, former coaches. Sure. So I think that goes against him. Yeah. When it, when former it, track record will always exactly, go against Exactly. His exactly. track record, precisely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily fair, but I, I understand why it happened. I think in this time period especially, yeah, they're they, not going to they stand gotta, for it. they got to be. They, they were putting so the much pressure down. on the FA to say, hey, you're gone. Yeah. And now they have U21 coach Gareth Southgate. He's a former player. Mm -hmm. He's in at the helm. Um, yeah, I think... I don't know, Felix, do you think if that were to happen in the NWSL, what would you say? Say, really, Brad, really, you're going to be discussing this on, on film, not yeah. just, oh, he said, she said. They have it on film. They, well, I mean, if they have it on film, I would argue this, this is a pretty big argument. <laughs> against, you, got against, your, you got your argument right there. Right. Um, I think in the NWSL, I think I, I would agree they'd probably go the same route they would fire. Yeah, and, I think. Um, yeah. Especially just, yeah. with all the big things going against the NWSL now. Oh, yeah. If this were to happen in the Very NWSL, true. they would shoot it down because there have been some big, yeah. bigger scandals. Lots and it's just, it's easier up. to fire him than to ask questions and put out like a whole case study. Yeah, right. Thing. Or yeah. if he, uh, it's fire or leave, but I think maybe he chose the right. If he, if he did, in fact, resign, I think that's a probably yeah. good decision because mm -hmm. you're just starting your reign and it's really going to be a, a big storm cloud over right. your, your head, at least for a while. Like, you know, that's good. And now I don't know what his future is. That's for him. Um, but with what time we have, we'll go back to the Premier League. Premier League. <sighs> Manchester City, <laughs> Arsenal, and Liverpool. This is what I'm going to say. These are the teams. I put two teams, but they're the three teams to watch, at least in the early going. There's been six games. Manchester City, Feeks' MC over here. Uh, 18 goals, five allowed, and are on top of the league. They're on a six-match win streak. No stopping them. Yeah. Um, now, Arsenal, 15 goals scored, seven allowed in third place. Liverpool with... Uh, where are they? 16 goals, 9 allowed there in 4th, and you have Spurs that are undefeated in 2nd. They have 14 in 2nd. Um, yeah, I don't think Spurs are going to challenge like they did, but I do think that Liverpool and Arsenal and City will be in it. And I know you guys are going to hate me for saying it, but I do, in fact, think Liverpool will have a run for the, for the title. Against Man City, eh, they beat Arsenal 4-3 already. I mean, they at, can some, handle it. at some point in the season, every team has an opportunity of to Of course they do. <laughs> That's what we said about Leicester, and yeah. then Leicester stayed on top. That's okay, true. after last season, if Leicester can win it, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. anything That's possible. fair. Anything don't rule it out. Don't rule out Liverpool. <laughs> They'll be the next <laughs> Leicester, because yep. they don't have a prestige <laughs> or anything. But yes, I, that's... I think that's what's going to happen. Again, if my Juventus prediction is wrong and if my Premier League prediction is wrong, mm -hmm. so what? So what? So <laughs> what? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> well, you heard it here first on KUR Sports on ISU TV. For all of our fantastic crew for stopping by today, as well as Hunter Smith, Michael Morell, Zach Williamson, Laurel Feeks, and Andreas Farr, I'm Taylor Mankel signing off for this week. Have a peaceful good evening.